So welcome uh, to the last session of the day. And uh, thank you for all of you who've been here, here all day long. Um, I know I've, I've learned so much today, and I, I hope you have as well. Um, we want to kind of end on thinking about what we might be able to do in order to reduce some of the inequalities that we heard about um, today. And um, so the plan for our comments is this. Um, Mary Ann's going to start off talking just simply about the State of the Union. We want to think about where we are with gender equality. Some of this we've already heard today, but also where we are with federal policy to reduce gender inequality. And then we are going to suggest that right now is not the best, we don't think it's the best time to be working on federal policy, so we need a new way forward. And uh, so we're going to think a little bit about what we might be able to do at the state, um, the city, and at the organizational level. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Marianne, and I'll come back up in a bit. So at the, the end of today, um, all these different presentations, really the question is where are we with gender inequality? Um, and analysis of the trajectory of women's economic and social development has a pretty clear pattern over the last five decades, which is that there was rapid progress through the 1990s. And then across a host of indicators, some of which we've touched on today, there's either been a slowing in the pace of progress or a stall in the pace of progress. Um, we have a couple examples that we point out in our article. If you look at uh, the labor force participation rates of women, um, just after World War II, there's about a third of women um, in the workforce. And then you see there's rapid progress. Uh, and then again, things start to stall out. So we had the, the highest employment rate was in 1999 um, at 60%. And you can see sort of a, a, a slowing or a, de a decline in women's labor force participation rates. Um, and the same thing is somewhat true for the gender wage gap, where you see really steady narrowing in, in the gender wage gap, especially in the, in the 1980s, and then again a stall or a slowing in this, in this pace at which this gender gap is slowing. So in some ways, women have made significant progress. And in some indicators, they're actually outpacing men. Right? Women are earning more bachelor's degrees, more master's degrees, now more doctorates than men. But what these uh, numbers tell us is that there are some major roadblocks in the way. And so then the question becomes why? And for me, sociology is all about why. Why is this happening? Um, and one of, there's many explanations, but one we're really focused on is that these transformations that we've experienced in work and family life have not been met with transformations in public policy or private organizational policies. Um, so while women flooded into the workforce, uh, we didn't see any changes really in organizational policy or federal policy. Um, Arlie Hochschild in her book, The Second Shift in 1989, which was one of the first ones to explore uh, dual income uh, couples. And there's a lot of conflict between these husbands and wives over you know, who is going to do the dishes or, or whose job is more important. And the way she described it is that you had faster changing women, women who were modern and wanting to have their own money and their own power, who are married to slower changing men. Right, who are kind of stuck in the past. And I just want to extend that. And her work extended that to say that it's, it's about faster changing women and slower changing everything else. <laughs> Men, organizations, policies, things like this. Um, so if you look at some of the changes in families, right? we have a, a, the number of single parent families has like doubled um, over the last few decades. And now women, 42% of mothers are the primary wage earners in their families. Right? This is a huge, if you think about what this means in the daily life of families, is that more and more women are getting up in the morning and going to work and earning the money that their family needs to survive. And many of them are on their own. Right? So despite these really large demographic changes that you think would have caused massive changes in how we organize work and the kinds of policies we might have, we haven't seen that. Right? If you look at this, so the United States is the only developed economy in the world that does not have a paid family leave policy or a paid sick leave policy. Right? So you see we're at the bottom. So this is kind of an interesting mismatch. Right? Families don't look the way they used to. More women are in the workforce. 
Um, and analysis that really compares the United States, if you think about the United States compared to all these other countries, has found that if it were not for the lack of employment supports for women, these kind of policies to help women work, women's labor force participation would even, it would be higher. The reason why it's lower is we lack these kinds of policies. And as we talked about earlier, sexual harassment remains an enormous problem in the workplace, causing women to leave their jobs or transfer jobs, um, and that has a huge economic impact for themselves and their families. So when we think about this problem, what are the kinds of federal policies that we would want to sort of jumpstart progress? Um, well, we want, want policies that help people meet these competing demands of work and family, right? Um, without being penalized for using the policy, right? So if you were needing to take family leave and you said, I'd like to take family leave, your, your boss wouldn't say, well, now's not a good time. Or without being financially penalized. And then we would also want a set of policies that uh, protect us against gender discrimination in its current form. So from explicit discrimination to implicit bias um, and obviously sexual harassment. So this is what we would need. And then what do we actually have? So we have the Family Medical Leave Act. Um, this is 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Um, and it only applies to people in um, working in places that have 50 or more employees. So only about 60% of employees in the United States are covered by this. Half of those say they can't take it because they don't, since they're not getting any wage replacement, they can't afford to take it. And of the people who do take it, almost uh, two thirds or so say that they have financial insecurity as a result. Um, then we have the Title VII, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, but this is sort of weakly and unevenly enforced, and you see over as different administrations come into office, the EEOC is um, either um, prosecuting a lot of cases or not, and, this, and the data that we're collecting varies, so it's really uneven. Um, and actually, the one additional issue with Title VII is that it's not effective in protecting against unconscious biases or implicit biases. So, a couple years ago, I was at um, the Summit for Working Families in uh, Washington, D.C., and President Obama spoke. Um, and what was really telling is that he said, um, this is what he said. So he was a sitting president in a room of people who care very deeply about providing families with um, you know, economic security and work-life balance. And he said, if Congress will not act, we're gonna need mayors to act. We'll need governors and state legislatures to act. We need CEOs to act. Which really is a moving moment. It's like, we're not gonna get it done here. So I want you all to go back and work for change at the state and local level um, because of the gridlock in Congress. I actually tried to look up how many times paid family leave has been introduced into Congress and how many times it's was rejected, but it was taking too long to figure out. But my sense is that it has been introduced almost every session. Um, and the name of it has changed, and now it's called the Family Act. But every time, it, it, never, it never gets through. Um, so that's what happened, is that people started focusing their efforts at state and local policies. Um, if you look at paid sick leave, for example, it's interesting because we uh, used this graph when we submitted our article, and then within a couple weeks, they had updated it. Um, so now, so these numbers are actually old, even though it was just a month ago. Um, so the most updated numbers are nine states, Washington, D.C., and 32 cities and counties have paid sick leave policies. Um, and when it comes to paid family leave, five states now have it, including California, which was, um, I believe, the earliest one. And what's interesting then also is because this uh, paid family leave went into effect in 2004 in California, we have many years of data to analyze. And the analysis that has come back is that 90% of employers said that there is a, a neutral to positive impact for them in terms of lowering turnover and in increased productivity, et cetera. So there was a huge pushback against how onerous this policy was gonna be in California and how um, it may negatively impact businesses, and that turned out not to be the case. Um, so at this point, then, the momentum is at the state and local level, but most of the efforts there have been focused on the work-life part 
of all of this, of creating an ability for people to care about their families and to provide them with some measure of economic security while they're doing that. And where we've had less movement is on addressing issues of discrimination and particularly implicit bias. And that's where organizations have actually been more um, on the cutting edge of policy innovations to address that. And this is what Shelley is going to speak to. So I want to spend um, a little bit of time talking about some of the work that we've been doing in the Clayman Institute, thinking about how um, organizational policies could reduce some of the inequalities that we've talked about here today. Um, and as Marianne alluded to, I want to speak in particular about policies um, that organizations have put in place to try to reduce the kinds of implicit or unconscious biases that are disadvantaging to women in the workplace. And we've had about 30 years now worth of studies that show that at an unconscious or implicit level, our cultural ideas about gender affect how we judge people's performances and potential in ways that are disadvantaging to women um, in the workplace, if you think about it, the point of hire, promotion, and the like. And David Padula, he reviewed some studies, I think, that really illustrate that, these resumes that you, know, you just change the name on them, and all of a sudden, you get sort of different evaluations of people, or the kind of things I'm talking about. And I want to focus on these uh, policies for two main reasons. Um, one is, that I think, that in the modern, in the water world of work, this is a major source of discrimination. So it's something important to intervene um, against. Um, and secondly, I think this is a place where um, organizations are uniquely able to make progress. Um, as Marianne pointed out, our laws haven't been able to deal with this kind of bias as effectively. Um, so uh, I was, I was uh, last year, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was here, and I was uh, interviewing uh, her and, in, and doing a panel with students. And one of the students um, asked the question to, to Justice Ginsburg, what do you think is the main barrier, the number one barrier that women are facing facing um, in the workplace today, and um, Ginsburg said unconscious biases. Quickly, she just answered that right away. And then later when I got, got to talk to her one-on-one, -on -one, um, she talked at length about the way that our, uh, our um, Title VII laws in the US really don't protect much against this kind of discrimination. So this got us really to thinking, what can organizations do? Um, and organizations have been working on trying to get beyond these kinds of biases um, for some time, and in two main ways. Um, the first is through unconscious bias training. And if you're here in the Silicon Valley, this is something probably something you've heard of. Um, unconscious bias training is where we teach managers and other people who are making evaluations um, about the way that stereotypes lead to bias in hopes that well-intentioned people will then be more careful in their decision making. And this has been very popular here in the Valley and is kind of spreading across the country at this point in time. Um, the second thing that's been done, and which has a longer history, is formalizing um, our um, evaluation processes or our people processes. That is, putting some guardrails up when people are interviewing people or when they're um, considering them for promotion. And the idea here is that if people have more formalized procedures, they'll be less susceptible to the effects of gender stereotypes. And both of these two approaches have had some success in, in reducing bias. Um, but even with both in place, we still see that our gender stereotypes continue to affect people's judgments. Um, the problems are well known. Unconscious bias training, even if done very well, um, tends to wear off over time, as any training does. And with formalized procedures, a manager's discretion in how they use the formal procedures um, leads to kind of a decoupling between what the procedure was intended to do and how it's being used. So at the Clayman Institute, as we were thinking about how we could bring about change, we recognized these limits, but we still thought that these were kind of the building blocks of change. And what we needed to do is more tightly couple or yoke them together. And I'm not going to spend much time on this, but uh, recently I wrote a paper um, where we were developing what we call a small wins model of change. And um, what we do is we start work, we, the key to this is we work with managers themselves. So we start by training managers, as you see in the red block. And then if you get over to that, thir that third block, the green, the green one, what we do is we work with managers after they've been trained to develop tools and procedures that can help block the effects of bias. So we're going to involve them in that process. And then we, we evaluate those tools, once we've created them, um, to look for what we call small wins, OK? To see if they're effective in a kind of a small wins way. A small win is a, a gain, um, you know, an improvement in, say, gender diversity outcomes that's visible. You know, you can see it, but is of maybe moderate importance. And what we like about the small wins is once um, once they're created and once managers see that they're making progress, um, what this can do is inspire uh, future change. And so I want to just show you some of the, I want to show you one example 
example of this that we've done. Um, we've been testing this model in five different companies, uh, well, five different organizations, uh, three technology companies, a professional services firm, and a nonprofit science organization. And I want to talk about one of them. Now, normally when you do this kind of work in organizations, you're under a non-disclosure agreement. You can't go and study if someone's biased and then use their name on your studies. They would never let you in to do that kind of research. But this company we were working with, and they were so happy with how things turned out, they just removed the non-disclosure agreement, and we're talking about it all over the place. And you know, I woke up to this in the New York Times, like, oh my God, they're not supposed to be talking about us. Um, this was in 2017. And the company is GoDaddy. And um, if you're a sports fan at all, you probably know one thing about GoDaddy. They're no, no, no telling what their product is, but what they're known for is horribly sexist Super Bowl ads. Okay, that's, that's you know, more than anything. That's what we say, GoDaddy, that's where people go. And, um, and so a new CEO comes in and says, you know, we want to really improve on our gender diversity outcomes. And I don't think those Super Bowl ads are helping us. Um, and reaches out to us to do some work with them and try to study how they might be able to improve their gender diversity outcomes. And, um, you know, they've been working a lot. We've been working some, so I don't want to take all the credit for this. But um, in 2017, they were recognized as one of the nation's top workplaces for women. So they've made a lot of progress. So what did we do with them? Well, we, we decided first that we would try to, um, do, to do some work on their performance assessment process, how they were evaluating their employees um, for promotion. And so we needed to first try to understand their process. So we spent some time trying to diagnose how things were going um, in terms of this process and, um, and whether or not bias might be creeping into this process. So we started off by interviewing the leaders of the company to get a sense of what their process was like. And we quickly learned there was no consistent process process in place. You know, every leader, every manager had his or her own process sometimes imported from their past jobs. So one person told us, we use the Yahoo process, which is kind of funny when you're not working at Yahoo. Um, secondly, we asked them about how they were evaluating people, and they said, oh, we evaluate them against our values, but a lot of their values were very vague, such as be phenomenal. I mean, how in the world are you supposed to evaluate someone on that? And then where they had more specific values and good sort of precise measures of them, the, the measures themselves often introduced bias. Um, so for example, one of their values was that leaders should be responsive. Okay, that sounds great. But how they were measuring responsiveness was how quickly someone was responding to emails. And they noticed that as they got to looking at it deeper, that women weren't responding as quickly to emails, especially during the dinner time hours. I'm like, no kidding. Um, you know. <laughs> and so um, they, they started realizing maybe that's not the measure of best measure of responsiveness. And they looked even further and said, you know, actually, the emails from women are more useful. But you can see why it would have taken a little longer to write a thoughtful email than to say, yeah. Um, and so we, then, um, so we then wanted to see what was going on. So we went in and we, we, we collected some data observing their calibration uh, meetings. And what a calibration meeting is, if you don't know, um, once a year in this company, managers write written reviews for um, each of their employees. They give it a, a rating. And then all the managers in a given area come together to calibrate the reviews to sort of smooth out the differences between easy and hard graders. And so here are just a few findings from that. First, we found that women were receiving more criticisms of their personality. Um, in particular, women were being called out for being too aggressive, okay, for being off-putting, too assertive, things like that. Um, and men were less likely to receive those um, criticisms. In fact, when men were described as aggressive, it was, a, it was usually a positive thing. He was aggressively driving change, aggressively doing this. So kind of a good thing. We also found that more time simply was spent talking about the men employees, okay? So that, you know, they were getting more of the airtime in the meetings, raising their visibility. And also they were receiving more what we might call standout adjectives. In other words, they were being described as visionary and genius and leading change and that sort of thing. And then finally, that women were more likely to get downgraded in, in these calibration meetings from a higher reading down to a lower reading. And I'll just kind of tell you how this works. Um, this is a, uh, what is called in HR a nine box um, evaluation system where employees are rated on uh, the X axis on a performance on goals and on the Y axis um, how, how much they're um, exhibiting the leadership values of the organization. And you can be low, medium, high on either of those, therefore getting nine boxes. And the goal, if you were an employee, would be into the, to be in those green boxes up in the upper right-hand corner. This is what they call the top talent boxes. And, um, and so what we found in this company is there was massive grade inflation. There were way too many people in the top talent boxes, so they needed to move some people back. And they often got moved back to the middle boxes, OK? And this was happening more to women than to men. They were being downgraded in the, in the calibration meeting, probably because they weren't being talked about a lot. They were being criticized for their personality and the like. And so we got these kind of numbers, with men being uh, significantly over represented in the top talent, and women overrepresented in these middle boxes. Middle boxes, a good, solid employee. You're not going to get fired, but you're probably not going to get promoted either. 
So we shared this out with them, and they were very concerned um, and wanted to do something to, to intervene. Um, and so we developed an intervention working with the managers, and I think this is key. The managers were key to, the, to what we created. Um, so we created a scorecard that they were going to complete for each employee, and they would then bring that to the calibration meetings. Um, and, and to create this scorecard, what they needed to do first was really think through their values. Are these the values we truly care about in our organization? And they realized, no, that a lot of them were outdated relics from the past. They also needed to develop measures of those values. And we're very clear that if they couldn't measure something, then it, you know, it's just you're opening the door to bias if you can't measure something. Secondly, they had had a lot of open-ended questions, Okay, just a box that you just write whatever you wanted. And um, what they switched to now is that managers were required to provide specific examples of what an employee did or what the employee could do better. And this is really important. Open boxes, you know, you're giving people just a lot of discretion in terms of how they use the instrument. That just opens the door to bias. Secondly, they decided to appoint um, criteria monitors during the meetings. This would be people who would speak up and say um, if a new criteria was being applied just to women. For example, she's being aggressive. If we're going to evaluate aggressiveness, we need to evaluate it for everyone. And so they did this, and they also allotted a specific amount of time for discussing each employee. And so what we found is we now we're going to sort of the next next wave we're observing another round of these calibration meetings now they've gone through this process and here are some of the small wins that we found um, in this next um, in this next wave first every manager had thoughtfully completed a scorecard for each employee so they all came in sort of prepared if you will um, because of this, um, gender differences and criticisms of personality were eliminated. There were nothing on the scorecard about people's personality. And so the idea was the only time you would write something down about someone's personality if it was affecting one of the things you were supposed to be evaluating them on. We saw greater consistency in using the criteria here. So they were, they were really using the scorecard. Um, and this led to significant um, decreases in these gender gaps we had seen earlier in the top talent and the middle box ratings. In fact, the middle box rating um, was no longer significant at all. The top talent still overrepresents men, but to a much smaller degree. And then finally, we saw that these small wins inspired other change efforts. So when we concluded this process, the managers working um, with us on this decided that they wanted to go and tackle their hiring process now on their own. Okay, This wasn't our suggestion. And they noticed that they didn't have as many women applying for their jobs as they had hoped and started looking at their job ads and thought maybe something like looking for a ninja rock star coder that could um, drive problems to the ground or something wasn't the kind of language that was that inclusive. And they, you know, there's some low-hanging fruit here, you know, when you start thinking about it. Um, and, and the next wave of hiring after this intervention, 50% um, of all of their new engineers that they hired that cycle were women, okay, and they were named one of the best places for women to work in tech. So this, we really saw some changes there. And then what's really encouraging to me is um, since then, the CEO of this company, who's a huge champion of uh, gender diversity, left. And anybody who knows anything about organizational change, if a good leader leaves, you're like, oh, no. Um, but this has gone on in our recent interviews. Um, these managers are still working on um, working on trying to improve their processes. And what I like about this approach then is what I think it does is it really empowers people to be change agents in their organization, and it harnesses the good intentions that lots of people in our organizations do have. So that's what we've been working on. I want to now just conclude more broadly um, in terms of social policy and kind of where, where I think we are at. And um, you know, as, as Mary and I are writing the paper and talking about it, I mean, I, th I think both of us think that federal policy to address the kinds of things we've heard about today would be ideal um, for lots of reasons, including federal policy um, applies to everyone, right? Um, smaller policies uh, at the state level, city level, um, organizational level don't. So this would be ideal. But it doesn't seem likely at this point in time. So lacking that, we sort of thought we need, to, we need to draw on what Obama said. We need to be working on these localized efforts at the city level, the state level, and at the organizational level. And not only should we be doing this because we can affect um, equality measures in these places where we intervene, so things are better in California, they're better at GoDaddy. Um, not only that, but when you make changes in lots of places at a small level, to the extent that those changes are visible to people, what you potentially do is to start to shift norms. People start thinking, we should have paid family leave. We should be able to get rid of unconscious bias. And if we can shift those norms, what we hope then is that when things change, when the policy winds change, we will have seeded the ground to make more progress. 
back progress, so we can go back to those federal things. And then finally, in my last point of conclusion, and this is really to the, uh, the academics in the room, and this is the, those of you who know me know this is the soapbox I've been on for the past two years. I rotate through different ones, but um, this is the one I've been on the past two years, and that is, as scholars of inequality, we know a great deal about the patterns of inequality, okay, and we know increasing amount about mechanisms, that is, how inequality is being produced, what's causing it. Um, and what I want to suggest that was that we can do more than just try to understand inequality, we really can, we can understand try to study and, um, and actually participate in the change process to the extent that we can create laboratories out there, whether they be our local municipalities or other kinds of organizations, we can, we can do some interventions to see what works and we can use that to better understand not just the patterns of inequality, but the mechanisms of change. So I'll stop there. <laughs>